So, welcome everybody. Um, thank you very much for being here on your Sunday. For those um, who don't know me, I see a lot of familiar faces, but for those new faces, um, my name is Cyrus Worles and I'm Director of Programs at the Institute for Spirituality and Health. And ISH uh, is a nonprofit in the Texas Medical Center. We are 65 years old and we've done a lot over that rich history. Um, and our mission is to enhance well being by exploring the relationship between spirituality and health. And I think um, questions, questions around the connection between spirituality um, in all of its forms, however, each of us considers um, spirituality and health, I think those, that intersection is um, rarely more salient than around issues of end of life, um, death, and what lies beyond. And so it was about four years ago, I believe, four or five years ago, that an intern of ISH, Anyang Anyang, um, decided to study near-death experiences and organize a program that we hosted in October 2016, um, which had as one of our speakers, Reverend John Price, who will be um, our keynote for the day. And uh, it was one of our most popular public programs that we have ever had. And through that, we decided to um, continue our engagement with near-death experiences. And last fall, uh, we connected with Kathy Beasley and Pat Johnson, um, who are here with us uh, as representatives from um, the International Association of Near-Death Studies, or IANS. And so in collaboration with them, we formed Houston IANS at the TMC, first Houston chapter of IANS. Um, uh, and we serve to, as a safe space for near-death experiencers to connect, um, as well as offer presentations that educate the public and healthcare professionals on what the near-death experience is um, and how we can all better understand it, what we can learn from it, and how healthcare professionals can better care for and, and uh, understand near-death experiences. So, this is our fourth meeting. Um, we had one pres our inaugural presentation back in February, and then we went virtual for a couple support circles in these last two months. Um, and now we're hosting our first virtual uh, keynote presentation with Reverend John Price. Um, and to introduce him, I will turn it over to uh, Pat Johnson. Um, Pat, take it away. Oh, thanks, Cyrus. Uh, yeah, I was lucky enough to meet John probably six or seven years ago at uh, the Austin Ions group when he spoke over there, and I've seen him speak at the symposiums in Austin uh, three times. So anyway, he's always very informative. A lot of the information that I've gotten from John, I've quoted him many times. So uh, keep your, your ears open and, and thank all of y'all for being here today. Uh, John has written the book, Revealing Heaven, The Christian Case for Near-Death Experiences. And during and since uh, the time of writing that book, John has inter interviewed over 400 near-death experiencers. He's done uh, extensive research on the, the lessons and the messages of the near-death experience. Um, he was an Episcopalian, uh, or is an Episcopalian priest. Uh, since 1965, and he served in churches in San Antonio and Austin and Houston. Uh, he was the chaplain to the transplant services at St. Luke's Episcopal, where he retired in 2004. Uh, in, in his Army career, he th served 30 years as a chaplain, where he re uh, retired as state chaplain colonel of the Texas Military Forces in, in 1995. And uh, today, John, uh, topic is is the transformation of a skeptic and the lessons and messages received from the near-death experience and we are so glad to have you here john uh, would you please lead us on thank you am, am i on now you are excellent excellent 
great to be with you. Good to see you. And I've, I've, look, I've run through the group of people who are on. I see a bunch of old friends here, and I'm delighted that you've come in on this. Um, <clears throat> the title for this, as given to me, was The Transformation of a Skeptic, which is pretty accurate. I was raised in a highly technical engineering uh, manufacturing business uh, family. My father was professor of oceanography at a and My brother was a civil engineering uh, master's candidate there when I was in, high, in junior and high, early high school. And um, I was raised with a, a um, the approach, the Aristotelian approach that if you can't prove it with five senses, uh, it must not be, it's immaterial and unimportant. Um, I was being groomed to become a mechanical engineer myself and go to work in the family company where I worked in the summers, um, high school and college, but quickly realized while I was good at it and understood all the principles of, of the stuff they were working on, this really wasn't what I wanted to do. I later learned that my temperament is such that I'm better off being a priest than a, an engineer. I would have been a frustrated engineer, very active at the church. <laughs> but with that, I was able to get a, a good liberal arts education at the University of Texas and, uh, and went on to seminary in Alexandria, Virginia, where the word spirituality was never mentioned, not brought up. The bull sessions at, in those days in the early 60s was, of course, uh, civil rights and the civil rights bill that was coming up and the death of Kennedy and uh, on and on. It was that era. And those were the issues that were discussed in uh, seminary bull sessions. Um, but I felt like something was missing in my life. And later on, I was able to get into uh, spirituality uh, big time. But in the meantime, uh, 1968, I became rector of a parish in Austin. And after I'd been there about a year or so, uh, a couple of ladies in the congregation decided they could, they could trust me. And they came to me and tried to tell me uh, what happened to them uh, when they died of one thing or another. And um, the experience they had while they were clinically dead, well, that didn't compute for me. That was, this was strange. It didn't help at all that the first person trying to tell me about her, what we later came to be called the near-death experience, uh, was the sort of person who would tell you anything to get your attention. <clears throat> so I, I just dismissed it like that. I didn't insult her or I didn't, didn't say, oh, that's nonsense or this couldn't have happened or anything like that. I was more pastoral about it, but I didn't really... Um, respond in such a way that she could, she would felt like she should discuss it any further. She obviously experienced a rejection on the subject before, so she went into her rejection mode and uh, got quiet. But as I like to put it, and here I'm gonna try to share, uh, Do you see that, those words, but then it happened? I'm trying to share that. Um, here, John, I'm gonna make- Can you hear me? Yeah, we can't see, so I'm gonna make it a host again. Try, try sharing your screen. Where's the button for that? Should be the green one right down below your image. We practiced this beforehand, folks, but we but, did. <laughs> uh, the green one, share screen. Okay. Ah, yes, there it is. But I've got to bring it up, apparently. No, not that one.
There we go. Okay. But then it happened. Um, I was at a uh, an army lunch, and two of the officers at the table with me told me about this fascinating book that they'd read, Life After Life by Dr. Raymond Moody. And it, and it was about it was what those two ladies were talking about. And I thought, well, I better read this book. So I bought it, read it, and was astonished. And I thought, well, I bet this is what they were trying to tell me about. Could it be that this was real? And the next month, I was on active duty at Fort Hood for my two weeks uh, annual training. And I was called in because a soldier was in a, a tough sh uh, spot. He'd broken his leg and he was supposed to be taken back to San Antonio uh, quickly. And the chief of staff said, I don't know how to do this. And I said, well, I know how to do it. He won't fit in my Toyota Corolla. He'll fit in your Ford LTD. Give me the keys to your car, Colonel. So we were friends. So he gave me the keys to his big Ford. And my driver and I went and got the, the soldier. And um, I said, hi, I'm Chaplain John Price. And I'm taking you home to San Antonio. I presume you know where you live. And he was astonished because here was an Anglo major coming in to drive him home. And he was from a barrio in East San Antonio, not used to having uh, Anglos come in and, and take care of him. So we weren't even off of Fort Hood before he started telling me about uh, being into sniffing glue and paint in elementary school, marijuana, junior high, high school, uh, got into hard stuff, dropped out of high school, went to California for a drug scene where one night he took a pill and he said, suddenly it was just the worst trip you ever had, painful and terrifying. But then suddenly there was peace and I felt like I was going through this tunnel. There was this bundle buzzing sound. And here suddenly was this dude made of light. And, uh, and I thought he died. That's what Moody, Moody described in his book. And um, he went on with it and how he saw what he was doing was contrary to, the, to uh, the will of the Lord, that he was throwing the gifts that God had given him back in the face of God. He woke up, he was told it was not his time. He woke up uh, in his body on the floor his buddies would stand over him slapping and say, hey man, you scared us. And uh, he got up and walked away cold turkey from drug addiction. Went back to San Antonio, apologized to his parents, got back in high school, graduated from high school, and joined the Texas Army National Guard where I met him with a broken leg. So my thinking just got turned around that these things were real. And then being open to this, things began happening with parishioners uh, dying and then coming back to life uh, with no treatment because they were dying of cancer and, uh, uh, and learning as well that people who were dying were terrified, who were terrified of it, were immensely soothed, relieved, calmed, calmed down and uh, bolstered in their faith when I told them about the near-death experiences that I was, uh, that I was uh, being privy to. Well, then I found when I would be called as a pastor to a, uh, an ICU or, or similar place where there was a death, grandmother had just died, there would be 10 or 12 uh, family members standing around, I would bring up the subject of the near-death experiences, trying to let them know what a beautiful, uh, loving experience their loved one was having. And when I would do this, if there were 10 or 12 people there, 75% of the time, there'd be somebody there who'd had the experience. And he would say, well, I had that experience. And yes, what you're telling is, is so. Or another member of the family would say, well, didn't you have that experience? Or one guy would come up to me and say, 
I had that experience, but he just hadn't told anybody, or he did try and nobody believed him. So I began finding more and more people. And um, uh, this just really went on. I see that I've told you these things. Was this what they were trying? And I told you about the soldier. Let's look at the scientific evidence for the near-death experiences. Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, uh, who wrote an outstanding book about the uh, various aspects of grief, suddenly was getting lots of um, emails and calls, well, not days before email, mail and calls, and people started to tell her about their um, experience while clinically dead. So she wrote a book about it. This book was largely ignored, and people were uh, skeptical about it, and uh, she was largely ignored by clergy and by uh, the medical profession. This was an unfortunate thing. And in the meantime, <clears throat> Raymond Moody uh, was in medical school, and a friend of his, his, his instructor, um, started telling him about his near-death experience that he had uh, when he was in the Army at Fort Bliss. So and Moody had had an experience with his mother when she was dying, that uh, he saw the, um, um, he, he even wrote a, a later book about it. He saw his mother ascending and saw the relationship that she had while he was standing there in the room with her dying. So he researched all this with, um, um, is it not working? Okay. Uh, he interviewed and examined 150 near-death accounts, and he's the one who coined the term near-death experience. There's some controversy about that. Some people say, no, 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 I didn't have a near-death experience. I had, a, I died. I had a full death experience. But nevertheless, the term has caught on and, and uh, it's what everybody uses. He published the book, Life After Life, in 75. He identified 10 stages or aspects to the full near-death experience. I'll go into those later. That go well beyond the famous tunnel and light that is so easily ridiculed by many. And he shows that anoxia, lack of oxygen, does not explain the rest of the 10 stages of near-death experiences, nor are the five more that I've come across and see that are fairly routine. <clears throat> Several MDs, puzzled by uh, their uh, hands-on experience with uh, patients who died, they resuscitated, and they later told the doctors what they had seen the doctors doing while they were clinically dead. And these group of MDs, uh, many of them got together, discussed this, and they founded the International Association for Near-Death Studies in 1981. <clears throat> One study that was extremely important was done in Holland by Dr. Pim van Lommel. Uh, he's a cardiologist, and he had patients who would tell him about what was going on in the operating room while he was operating on them while they were clinically dead. And this was so counter to what the neurologists were saying that when the brain dies, the mind, consciousness, ceases to exist. <clears throat> so how to explore the claims of consciousness after death? He placed a shelf seven feet up in up the wall in 10 hospital operating rooms and put large cards on each one with random numbers and letters on them. They then uh, interviewed patients who had clinical deaths in those spaces. And 18% of them uh, related the usual near-death accounts and the after effects. Uh, the experiment has been replicated in many other hospitals since. He, uh, most could tell what was going on, who was where, 
what was being done. A smaller percentage could relate the numbers and letters accurately. And I'll get into why it was a smaller percentage a little later. This was all published in the Lancet, which is the British Medical Association's uh, official publication that they put the, the newest stuff in, in back in 2001. And there's the reference on the Lancet. Beware the conventional wisdom because uh, remember the battle to get surgeons just to wash their hands before surgery back in the 19th century. An awful lot of people, awful lot of doctors oppose the concept that there is anything uh, that can happen to somebody while they are clinically dead. Uh, I worked with lots of doctors while I was at St. Luke's Hos Episcop then Episcopal Hospital and found that the MDs generally fell into two categories. Those who routinely worked with um, resuscitations and they understood it and were excited when I would talk to them about what, the, what their, the doctor's patients were telling me happened to them while they were clinically dead, such as awaiting a new heart. Um, and then there are the MDs who do not regularly participate in resuscitations and they lean on the conventional wisdom uh, and can get combative about it. Uh, so that's where things sit with them. Scientific evidence continued. Kenneth Ring is one of the founders of the uh, of IANS, and he um, decided that there needed to be a particular interest in, in this with people who were born blind or had been blinded after premature birth and being placed in incubators with too much oxygen, which destroyed their optic nerves. So he interviewed 21 such people and published his results in a book called Mindsight in 2008. And in their, in their, during their clinical deaths, these 21 souls floated up out of their body and suddenly they could see everything around them and relate it afterwards in great accuracy and in color. It's a fascinating book to read. I, ur I urge reading it. There are many such stunning accounts. There's one famous one where a patient would have brought into an emergency room dead, and they, uh, one of the first things that had to happen was to get his dentures out so they could put a, a tube down his throat. And uh, a nurse got the dentures out and opened a drawer and put these dentures in the drawer and closed it in a rolling cabinet. Here, days later, when he woke up, he said, by the way, can somebody get me my dentures? Dentures? We don't know anything about any dentures. He said, yes, yes. Uh, a nurse took them out of my mouth when I was brought in. In mind, he was clinically dead. And put them in the third drawer down in a rolling cabinet in the emergency room. <clears throat> well, somebody went to that rolling cabinet in the emergency room. There, third drawer down, were the dentures and were brought to it. That stunned a few people. There was another one about a, uh, somebody told a nurse that she had, she had left her body and gone outside the hospital and the nurse didn't believe her. Um, and she said, well, yes, if you go and look out the window, uh, there's a tennis, blue tennis shoe on the ledge outside the window. And the nurse went and looked at it and said, yes, indeed, there it is. Seeing people on the other side, that they didn't know were dead. I've had several accounts told me about that. There are too many more to go into given our time frame. Scientific evidence continued. George Gallup of the famous Gallup uh, polls ran a poll in 1981 in the US and found that 18% of the American population in 1981 had had what he called a verge of death experience. And where they uh, wrote it up in the, uh, in the uh, forms that he sent out, they were described by the returnees in the same terms as those related by Moody in the book, Life After Life. 
the book that Gallup published in 1982 was Adventures in Immortality, McGraw Hill. The USA population in 1980 was uh, two, 226 and a half million people. 18% of that is nearly 41 million returnees, I like to call them. Uh, experiencers is more of an official term uh, in 1981. Now, that's nearly 20 years ago. Just think how much more effective resuscitation techniques are today. I wish the Gallup organization would do the, do the survey study again. Here in Houston, um, the official population in Houston at, at the end of 2019 was 2,320,000 times 18% means here in Houston, we've got 417,000, nearly 418,000 returnees. A full convention held at once would fill all the major venues in the city, the Astrodome, the NRG Center, Lakeway Church, Toyota Center, and all the Starbucks. The 15 aspects of the full near-death experience. Begin with a movement into death. And in the people that I visited with, I find 11 such variations, there may be more that I just haven't heard yet. Floating up out of the body, seeing everything going on. Going through a tunnel towards a light. Getting up and walking away from the body. Elizabeth Crone, uh, who's looking on, had this experience. She got up and walked away from her, her body that had been killed by a lightning bolt in the parking lot of her synagogue. And um, she thought she was walking over to the synagogue with her two little boys, getting in and out of the rain. Was surprised when she turned around and saw her body there. And that's when Elizabeth realized that she was dead. George Ritchie, MD, told this in his book, Return from Tomorrow, he was uh, one of Raymond Moody's uh, instructors in the medical school, and he talked about his death. Um, he was in the army at Fort Bliss, got pneumonia, and uh, the doctors said, you cannot use your uh, weekend pass and tickets to go to San Antonio. You're going to stay right here in bed. When the doctors left, he tried to, he decided, I'm going to go. So he got up and started looking for his clothes that they had hidden. And an orderly walked right through him. And he thought, that's puzzling. He went over to his cot and said, look at that. They've already put somebody in my bunk. And as he looked at it closely, he could see it was him. And that was the instant in which he realized he was dead. So a lot of people who get up and walk away from the body don't realize they're dead. Another is zipping off at light speed to the next step. Another is going in directly into a distressing or hellish experience, and I'll talk about that later. Or going directly into a void and staying there. Uh, several people have told me that it was like um, being in a womb again, <coughs> in which they learned lots of things about themselves that they hadn't known. Another was a pinpoint of light comes and grows and engulfs you. Another is going directly into a fantastic experience like Evan Alexander explained in his book that is so very good. And he's a very good lecturer on this subject. Another is Jesus comes and gets you or some, depending upon the person's um, religious background, a, their spiritual leader that, they're, that they most trust comes and greets them. A little girl and a woman told me that, that Jesus came and, and got them. The little girl said, you know, mommy, Jesus came and got me at age we, eight, day, eight weeks of life, eight weeks of life. But he brought me back to you there, she said, uh, pointing to Breckenridge Hospital as they drove past. That lady never missed church after that. Um, a brief meeting with a loved one off to the side. Now there is another. Nothing. 
there are people who have had clinical deaths and say nothing happened to them. That's my story. 15 months ago, I died. Um, happily for my family and friends, I was at the courthouse where the county commissioners had um, earlier voted to put um, AED machines in all county courthouses, all county facilities on each floor with somebody there to uh, maintain them and, and trained how to use them. And the, a team jumped on me and so I'm back. Um, I had a, my left ventricle went into fibrillation and quit pumping. I had no experience. I went to the IANS meeting in uh, Pennsylvania afterwards where I saw PMH Atmore, one of the great leaders in this movement, who had three experiences and has written, is visited with 3,000 adults, 600 children, and has written six or seven books on the subject. And I said, why did I not have an experience? And she said, well, John, I know you, I read your book. I know the work you've done. You already had the personality of someone who's been through the experience. You uh, didn't need the introductory course. So people who already have an empathetic personality, caring and loving, don't need all the, uh, the introductory course, as she put it. And that's her uh, consideration of the, out of the thousands of people that she's interviewed. <clears throat> the next step, once you've exited the body, a joyous reunion with dead friends and relatives and pets, pets, even pets. At one IANS meeting <clears throat> in Durham, <clears throat> someone mentioned that and people started calling out their own experiences, dogs, cats, horses, terrapins, parakeets, amazing. but they're bathed in intense and expressible love. No human language has enough superlatives to express how completely uh, loving the experience is in the most beautiful place with the most beautiful music. And greeted by Jesus, or if for those who, uh, because of their religious background, were painted a uh, horrible picture of Jesus as a, uh, a uh, very wrathful, uh, mean judge, uh, the most uh, loving uh, person that they know on the other side, such as grandfather, uh, is the one that greeted them. Um, several accounts of that. Then they go into a review of your life with uh, Jesus or some other spiritual being, and you see everything not just from birth, but for many of them, they said they saw their experience from before birth, when their soul entered into the fetus. Raymond Moody and I were on a radio program together in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, the year my book came out, and we came to the conclusion <clears throat> that this review of one's life is the equivalent of 30 years of psychotherapy because no psychotherapist can get Pat back to the first three, two and a half, two years of someone's life where essentially important things happen. Um, but in going through this with every moment that is important being seen, people are psychologically healed by the experience. And that review of one's life is done in love and warmth and forgiveness, even humor, uh, despite, uh, in, in contrast to the uh, many religious statements that Jesus is a wrathful judge, and you're going to hell if you do this, that, or the other thing. Then they sometimes go and get instruction by angels, which most people cannot now remember. George Ritchie, in his book, Return from Tomorrow, um, who had been an atheist, a rather a very mean atheist, in fact, <clears throat> had a complete turnaround in his experience. And uh, he, he recently retired as a 
United Church of Christ pastor, and he's operating a mission in Belize, Central America. And he says he remembers much of what he was told. But then being told, it's not your time, which can happen at any point along this uh, list of stuff. It can happen at any point. Then there's a return to the body. Now here is where <clears throat> Moody's list leaves off and I pick up. I find that there's a reluctance to talk about it. People learn quickly not to talk about it because people, uh, a lot of the people that they talk to <clears throat> and try to tell about this experience, tell them, no, 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 you must not talk about that. I've got so many experiences, so many accounts of people who were told emphatically by family or friends or pastors uh, not to talk about it. So they clam up and years later, they decide I've really got to do something about this. That was Elizabeth Crone's experience was that she 20 years later, 25 years later decided uh, when she saw my book uh, talked about on uh, television and in the newspaper and she read it, she called me right away and said, we've got to talk. We had a four hour lunch, became good friends. New abilities. Not everybody has these, not everybody has the full list of new abilities, but uh, I'll tell you an example. I was walking from my house down to uh, Whole Foods and a policeman came trotting over to me and said, I wanna, I wanna meet you, you're a fascinating person. And I thought, what is this? And he said, no, 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 I wanna meet you. You're a fascinating person, who are you? I told him. Something told me, I bet it was my angel screaming at me, book, tell him about the book. So I said, well, um, I'm somewhat famous for having written a book about the near-death experience. He got very excited. He says, that's it. I had the experience. Really? Tell me about your experience. So he did. He was very, very ill and died, and <clears throat> but he was in the hospital and they resuscitated him. But in the meantime, he had a full near-death experience in which he learned what he was doing wrong in his life and what he should do and what he would be able to do. And he was resuscitated, came back to his body. He became a policeman because he hears the thoughts. Remember the moment I described in which he and I met. He came up and said, you're a fascinating person. Who are you? And I thought, what is this? And he said, no, 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 I want to meet you. We had a conversation where he heard my thought and he spoke to that. He sees angels, he sees dead people. He has the ability to see auras around people. I said, you see auras, uh, different colors. He said, yes, but the ones that really fascinate me the most are people with a black aura. I've had to arrest most of them. There's no law against having a black aura but it's a type of behavior that someone with a black aura then gets into. He says he has the highest arrest record in the department of uh, drug dealers and the like. Uh, and he has feelings about a car that's just driven past and he finds a reason to stop them and does and finds the drugs and the weapons and stuff in them. Um, I was uh, driving from San Antonio to Austin in a car that I'd bought, used, and it had a, a switch on the dash with a light bulb in it that would tell you when you'd turned on the motor for the heater and defroster, and this was a cold day. And uh, it never worked when I owned it, and I asked about replacing that, and I was told, no, 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 too expensive. And it'll burn out anyway. So I picked up this Green Beret uh, medic, it turned out, who was hitchhiking to go up to Austin. When he sat down in my in the passenger seat, the light came on. And I said, that light, it's never worked. And he grunted acknowledgement of it. When I got to Austin and he got out at Riverside Drive, the light went off. And I, and I thought, what is this? 
decades later, I learned about the electromagnetic field that a lot of experiencers have around them that runs down batteries, blows out tungsten light bulbs when they're going. And in this instance, it got the two, film, the two broken filament edges to come together and glow again for the first time since uh, it had broken earlier. This can be distressing, hearing others' thoughts. That would include uh, sexual references by men and women at someone. And some of those might be embarrassing and, and distressing. You can understand. I'm just as glad not to be able to hear thoughts. I do wish I could see auras around people. Absolutely no fear of death. In fact, many resent being returned. One of the first people I talked to after having my mind opened up was Bishop Roger Silly. He was the suffragan bishop, that is, assistant bishop of the Diocese of Texas. And he told me that when he was a professor of, of drama at the University of Texas, he was killed in a car wreck and was resuscitated. <clears throat> and that's when he decided that he was in the wrong line of work and he went to seminary, became a priest. I'm such a fine priest, we elected him bishop, a suffragan bishop. And uh, he told me about his experience, and he said, but I'll tell you this, John, I'm not at all afraid of death anymore. So there is another uh, example. But of course, anybody that reads these accounts can come to the same conclusion. Death is nothing to be fearful of. And very often, people come back with a better personality walking away from addictions, like the uh, soldier I told you about, who turned my thinking around. Um, the better personality comes from, as a result of the uh, review of their life, the, being equivalent to 30 years of, of psychotherapy. A 15th aspect of the, new, of the full near-death experience is a new spirituality, developing a stronger sense of God's presence and existence become a far more empathetic, caring, loving person, develop an awareness of the meaning and purpose to life. Do need time to sort it all out, to be able to express it. I've spoken with several people, Elizabeth Crone included, who will tell you in her excellent book um, that it took her, after initial rejection by her rabbi, it took her 20, 25 years in seeing uh, uh, the newspaper article about my book for her to decide going to contact him. And uh, she is not, not at all the only person who's ever, there's plenty of people who've, who've told me about their experience and said, you're the first person I've ever told. That's an awesome moment in a pastoral, pastoral relationship. And the ears gain a belief in the sacredness of all life. You find a reduced interest in material gain. That can lead to divorce. If the spouse uh, loves all the advantages of the, the uh, person who used to be driving for money and he's not anymore, or she's not anymore, there can be a divorce. They realize they have knowledge of God. Carl Jung had a near-death experience. He wrote it up in his book, um, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, his autobiography. And in that, he, he told about his near-death experience. I saw an interview of Jung by the BBC, and the interviewer asked him, Dr. Jung, do you believe in God? And Jung said, no, I know God. Key point. I've never been to Berlin. My son, my sons assure me there is a Berlin. I've seen photographs of what purports to be Berlin, but I know Houston. You see the difference? May many in the ears end negative and unloving relationships and seek out positive loving ones. There's another issue of, that leads to divorce in much the same way that somebody has gone through the AA program realizes that their spouse is only an enabler for them. 
or uh, somebody who comes back from a ferocious combat experience. As an army chaplain, I ran, I ran into an awful lot of guys that came back from Vietnam and got divorces or were divorced because they had, they had changed. There's such a change in people at that point and the near death experience. And, and they'll, and the, one of the things that happens is people will leave a church that preaches hate, fear, and guilt. There's, E.M.H. Atwater made an awfully good point to me one time. She said, there's really only two religions in the world. There's a religion of fear and a religion of love. And that delineation cuts through all the faith groups. You will find Buddhists who are very loving. You'll find Buddhists who will massacre um, other Buddhists there in, in uh, Thailand. You'll find right on down through the line um, within Christ Christianity, you'll find people that will be, um, will, will teach fear, hate, and guilt. And others that would teach love. Do you realize there's four opposing points of view about life after death in the general population? They're also in the Bible. That's why there is corresponding confusion around the concept of life after death. The important issue of many dying folks and hospital hospice clients uh, as they get close to death is to realize the truth and, and, and not be terrified. One of the four points of view about life after death is correct, as borne out by the near-death experience accounts. The first, the oldest account um, that you find an awful lot of people today believing, the dead just sleep in the ground. No, that's not even the most, most popular. Well, I'd hate to say which is most popular, but this is the, this is the oldest one in the Bible. Uh, don't wake them up. Deuteronomy 18.11 forbids consulting mediums because the concept is they're sleeping in the ground. Don't wake them up. And in 1 Samuel 28, Saul consults a medium in Endor to find out what's going to happen in battle the next day. Samuel he says, says to the medium, bring up Samuel, who was dead. I need to know what's going to happen. And Samuel is, chastises him for waking him up and says, today, you, tomorrow, you, you and your sons will be with me, namely, in the ground. And second, the second um, oldest point of view in the Bible about life after death is in Daniel 12, where it says the dead, the dead sleep in the ground until some future time when they're raised and judged and the, the uh, righteous will go to eternal bliss and the unrighteous will go to eternal shame. And then, of course, Jesus talked about the Sadducees in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who say there is no resurrection, no such thing as life after death. That's why they're Sadducees. The one that is correct is, of course, laid out by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, where he just says, here on earth we have a mortal body, but at death then we take on a spiritual body. Now that, as you can see, was a totally new concept in that culture. So the people in, in Corinth must have said, uh, wait, what, where do you get this? So in 2 Corinthians 12, he writes, I know a man in Christ who went to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, <clears throat> God knows, but that this man went to paradise. And in Acts, uh, I think it's the eighth chapter, <clears throat> uh, there's discussion about how Paul was so rejected in many cities where he went talking about Jesus. And in one town, they got, the men got so angry, they, they dragged him out of town and stoned him and left him for dead. Well, I think that was the moment of his near-death experience because uh, I've talked to so many people who were sent back because they had not completed their life. Uh, issue. And certainly at that point, Paul had not completed his life issue, his, his life's journey, the work that he had to do.
the arguing in the Bible produced varying points of view on life after death in the general population that you, that you see. Nothing, lights out, fini, say to, nalamas. After Jesus returns, the, jives, the dead are risen, risen, but not until then. That's putting together the statements in uh, Daniel 12, together with rather vague statements in the book of Revelation that say we're waiting for Jesus to return. But Jesus said to the thief on the cross next to him, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Note, that thief had most likely not been baptized. A friend of mine, Jeff, who uh, lives outside Austin, was killed when a ditch collapsed on him. And his buddy dug him out and, and, and resuscitated him, got him to a hospital. When he got out, when Jeff got out of the hospital, he went to tell his family's pastor about that he died and went to heaven. And the pastor said, you couldn't have been, you couldn't have gone to heaven. You haven't been baptized. That's the sort of thing that, can, that happens where clergy don't understand these things. And he went on to say, we don't go to heaven until Jesus returns and he ain't returned yet. So that kind of a, of a theological approach about it needs to be educated about the reality of these near-death accounts. Jesus said, I have other sheep who are not of this fold. He said that in the, in the Gospel of John. And that reminds me of people who say, only members of my church will go to heaven. Well, I visited with a number of Jews, three, a bunch of Hindus, a couple of Buddhists, a Muslim, six gays, and a slew of a religious Americans, all of whom had a beautiful experience. And I mentioned this in a Lutheran church. And one man there stood up and said, but I thought only Christians went to heaven. And I replied, if you have a problem with God letting non-Christians in, I would suggest you take it up with him. He's the one that let them in. People of other cultures experience heaven in their own way. Their heroes greet them uh, to the happy hunting ground, to Valhalla, Nirvana, Shangri-La. And my source for that is Dr. Jeff Long, who had a near-death experience himself and founded the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation, which is available to you online in DERF. Dot org. Jeff has collected thousands of accounts and has written a couple of books about it. Um, um, and so uh, one is, uh, his second book was Proof of, Proof of God. I visited with 22 people so far who've had distressing or utterly hellish experiences. What they had in, had in common was <clears throat> they were truly mean people. The opposite of love one another as I have loved you, Jesus' only commandment. The more cruel they were, the more hellish the experience. There is justice, but live in love. Sixteen were sent back, warned to straighten out their lives, and 15 of them did. The 16th one I know is in denial that she's still mean. The seven returnees I spoke with who were in hellish torment cried out while they were there, help me Lord, or help me Jesus. And we're out of there and in a hospital. Those people and the 15 turned their lives around and speak of these distressing experiences as the best thing that ever happened to them because they realized from them what was uh, really wrong in their lives and as well why they had become the way they were and straightened that out. There is justice, there is mercy. Acts 2.21 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And um, several of the people who told me this, uh, well, one was a very famous atheist, um, 
Raymond, I don't know, um, Storm, Dr. Storm. He was an art professor and a very mean atheist. And he died and he had this experience. And when he, he, he had a hellish experience that he tells about in his book, um, and this was his experience saying, help me Jesus. And blink, he was out of there. What about suicide? Suicide to escape excruciating pain and no hope of recovery will be met with love and forgiveness. That needs to be said right off the bat. But generally speaking, there are varieties of experiences, none great. Some wind up in a forest at dusk in a fog, wandering around saying, what has happened? What is, what is there? Some wind up on a featureless plane. I like to uh, say that it's rather like instead of going to Hawaii, they went to West Texas. Some wind up in the blackest black they've ever seen. <clears throat> All are still aware of the pain and problems which drove them to this act, but now unable to do anything about them. And aware of the pain, suffering, anguish, and grief that they cause their loved ones and friends. What of this post-suicide state is permanent? Recognize I've only spoken with returnees, but one returnee mentioned seeing a suicide in the joyous reunion group. Uh, a relative who had committed suicide. It's someone, it, it's sometimes said to me with great ferocity by religious conservatives. Jesus said it's appointed once for a man to die once. But Jesus didn't say that. It's in Hebrews 9, 27. And this point of view forgets that Elijah prayed for the dead son of the widow of Zarephath to come back to life, and he did. Jesus prayed for the dead son of the widow of Nain to come back to life, and he did. He prayed for the dead daughter of the uh, leader of the synagogue to come back to life, and she did. And who can forget Lazarus? He was dead for four days. His body stank. And actually, it's appointed once for a man to die is correct if you consider dying permanently. Because everyone I've talked to uh, didn't die permanently. Jesus was informed Lazarus was dead. And here we find the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. I think Jesus wept because he was going to have to bring his friend back from four days in paradise. Implications for spirituality. God is. God is loving. God is forgiving. Jesus is real. There is life after death. Heaven is real. So is hell. There is mercy. There is justice. Love is a commandment for life permanently and for, I can't read my writing there, quality of life. Death is only a moment in the ongoing life of a soul. We can be sent back if it's not too late and healing occurs. Elizabeth Crone can tell you about that. We are a soul in a temporary body. God is present with us 24 seven. There are angels. We each have an angel or two. What about reincarnation? I would say, don't limit the powers of God. Plenty of people have told me about how they saw that they had, had been something else, been in another, in a previous life, and uh, saw their uh, soul entering into their fetus and being born and having a new life. And I've been convinced myself that this must be where you've, you have children who are magnificent pianists or violinists or uh, artists, that they're some, in a previous life, they were a, a, a 
an outstanding pianist or violinist or artist. Do I believe in reincarnation? I'm not sure. Maybe I did in a previous life. There is some humor to be had from contemplating these near-death accounts. I'm grateful to Gary Larson for giving us this. Story of Robert. <clears throat> Robert was pastor of a church of thousands. He was on radio and television, led revivals over the South, and he was a hellfire and damnation preacher. Then he had an NDE. When he went into a black void and felt immense love. And uh, when he got out of the hospital, he went back and he started talking in church about God's love and forgiveness. The congregation, which was used to hearing him talk about hellfire and damnation for everybody, if you ever sin, walked away. In their minds, he'd become a her heretic. And the money melted away. And the bank took the church back. And many friends and his recovering alcoholic daughter left him. She later read my book and returned to him and uh, lovingly. But he said to me, uh, I've lost my career. I can't tell those lies anymore. I can't preach that crap. Scientific evidence continues in other areas. Liz Dale, PhD, interviewed 21 gay men and lesbians and who'd had clinical deaths and reported their near-death experiences. She had them write up their accounts. She edited them, edited them for publication. All were positive, beautiful experiences of paradise. And the book was entitled Crossing Over and Coming Home, published 12 years ago. I met her at the IANS conference in San Antonio. She's writing another book with many more accounts, now to include transgender accounts, one of whom I met at that conference. Many implications. For theology, God is loving and forgiving. For religion, a loving one is the authentic one. For ethics, should be based on love, compassion, and empathy. <clears throat> These count. Funeral practices should be a celebration of life. It's not a defeat. Justice and mercy, we get back to this, um, the key point, God is loving and forgiving. Pastoral, people dealing with death need to know about the wonderful, loving time ahead. Biblical interpretation, <clears throat> the emphasis should be on God's love. That is the lens with which to read the Bible. Faith, knowledge from the near-death accounts about all these points. Quantum physics will tell you that there are parallel universes. Could that include, could that explain heaven and hell? I don't know, I'm not a uh, quantum physicist. Transplant, I was the transplant chaplain at St. Luke's. As I again heard more and more stories about this, I thought, when do you harvest the organs? How long do you wait? What do you make sure? Uh, I know a lady that lives just outside Austin who was pronounced dead after 45 minutes on the operating table of resuscitating her, or her coming back to her body. She went in and out, in and out, six or seven times. They gave up after 45 minutes, started writing it up. <clears throat> uh, the nurses took over and, and processed the body and put it in a, in a body bag and it takes at least 45 minutes from the time someone dies on the operating table to get down to the morgue. And she woke up in the morgue in a body bag and began talking, which freaked out the morgue workers. The 
Death is a holy moment, but largely feared and misunderstood by most people. That's the concept of death by most people. There's a larger context many do not know or understand. I had the lady who painted herself in and as the uh, mourning child there in the red t-shirt. Her mother is in hospice as we speak. And I described a moment of death to her. And this is what she came up with, according to what I had described, that the uh, spirit soul sits up in a body in the prime of life and is greeted by others in the prime of life. We can, we can guess who they were, perhaps her mother and father, greeted by her dog and cat. Now, the artist who painted this, that after I asked her to do it, did some interesting things with it. The three windows are the windows in the chapel at St. Bede's in uh, the uh, uh, ministry to the chaplaincy at St. Luke, at, at, uh, at Rice University. Um, and the rug under that you see on the floor underneath the bed is the rug on which the altar sits in that chapel, where every Wednesday night, uh, we have a healing service. And Jackie Campbell, the, the artist who painted it, and it depicted herself in it there in the lower right-hand corner, um, is one of the people that comes in and prays. So Jackie had painted this as death as the ultimate healing. And notice that the uh, couple that walked in from the side came from a beautiful path leading out to a, to a lake. That's what Elizabeth Crone described to me in, as happened to her in her experience. So I wrote a book uh, talking about the implications that I saw from the 200 I'd visited with at the time. And it's available on internet, various internet booksellers. And another is coming, no telling when. Let's go back. Uh, you can just hit the uh, stop share. If stop you... share. I don't. I don't see it. Can you return the? Can you stop the sharing? Oh, there it is. There right. There we go. Thank you. Well. Um, questions, answers, comments? So for those who have questions, I would suggest, um, since we have a large number of participants, that you um, just post your question in the, in the chat um, so that we can, we can take them in order and avoid people unmuting themselves all at once. see a th numeral three in, in chat there. From Bruce Anderson to everyone, what do the skeptics say? Well, uh, Scientific American Magazine has a regular column by a skeptic <clears throat> and I've written to him and he takes the conventional wisdom stance and ignores the thousands of accounts. So some of them are really locked in to uh, being a skeptic. Sorry to see it. I don't think that's scientific. Um, my father was professor of oceanography at a and and he made the point regularly that uh, a scientist should be open-minded and ready to address things when, when the evidence comes that to open his eyes. And that, of course, is a biographical statement. From Kathy Beasley to everyone, what is your best advice for sharing? Oh, good point. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> talk about it. If you've had the experience, talk about it. Don't let skeptics uh, stop you. Don't let, if you're, if you're a member of the clergy, tells you that that's ridiculous, you couldn't have gone to heaven, uh, Jesus hadn't come yet, 
what walk away from that place because there are churches that will understand you and, and accept you and, and uh, uh, celebrate with you your wonderful experience. From Robert Hesse, have any of those you interviewed? And I can't, how do I go about seeing the rest of that statement? It says, uh, uh, okay. you see it? Um, Robert Hesse said, have any of you of the, have any of those you interviewed had non-death mystical experiences either before or after their NDE? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> Elizabeth Crone wrote this up in her book um, about, she was lying in bed one night at 2.30 in the morning with her husband, and the phone rang. And um, her husband said, answer the phone, answer the phone. So she answered the phone and both of them heard the voice of her dead grandfather speaking to her and saying, your mother is looking for an important document and can't find it. And I've been trying to tell her where it is, but she can't hear me. <laughs> uh, so you call her and tell her where the document is. And she called her and told her and there was the document. And when, when Elizabeth mentioned that at the um, meeting at, I, at, at Ish, why Jeff Cripple spoke up, professor of um, comparative religions at Rice, and said, yes, there's two books that have been written about uh, this very thing, about after-death communication. And I've got one of these books here at my house. Um, Arlene, would you bring it to me? It's a paperback book right there. Um, hundreds, hundreds of after-death communications, including telephone calls. And, and Dr. Cripple said that one of the first ones to happen like this, Is that it? no, 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 it's a small paperback book on it. Oh. there. <clears throat> hello from heaven. Yes, hello from heaven is the name of the book. <clears throat> and uh, one of the ironies of all this is that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone and he was what was called a spiritualist in the 19th century. He went to seances and the like, and he was trying, among other things, to invent a device that the dead could call the living on. And he died not realizing he'd succeeded. Here's this book, Hello from Heaven. It has hundreds, hundreds, maybe thousands of accounts of after-death communications. So yes, Robert, there are such things like this. And Melody says, I'm still unclear about whether the dead need to wait to be judged or whether or if they can immediately go to heaven. You know, I didn't have the opportunity when I died. I was, I was told it's not your time, dude. My last thought was, I'm drowsy. My next thought was, why am, I, why am I in an ambulance? But I had this powerful feeling, it's not your time. Anybody else? What's your best advice for sharing your NDE? That was, that was Kathy, but I've got one um, that came yes. just to me, and it's uh, the, the 15 aspects of the NDE. Do they go in order or can they skip some? Oh, they can skip, but generally they go in that order, the people that I've talked to. And I say that with, with a, a general caveat, is that all this is the four, out of the 400 people I've talked to, plus a couple more hundred uh, accounts that I've read. And Frida, says reincarnation. I'm still wondering about the why. Well, here you're getting into uh, some of God's thinking, obviously, and um, it's, it would just be speculation on my part. God never told me uh, why there would be such a thing as a reincarnation, but um, you could consider that <clears throat> people who are souls who have terrific uh, capabilities, need to be able to share those with 
I think of all the, the uh, child prodigies who obviously had uh, some great ability in their previous life that uh, needs to be in general population. So they're sent back with it. Uh, or perhaps um, the person had a life in which they weren't what they should have been. And so this gives them the opportunity to have a better life. Um, that's speculation on my part. Let's see. Anyone else? Well, what's your best advice for sharing your, your NDE? Well, go to the IANS meetings. Uh, they're held around the country Labor Day weekend, and you can look up IANDS.org. They'll tell you how to register for them and, and get to them. But as well, we've started an IANS chapter here in Houston, uh, largely with some of the uh, leadership out of the, the Central Texas chapter of IANS, which generally meets in Austin. Um, they've, uh, Kathy Beasley and Pat Johnson came and helped us start this Houston chapter. And I'm delighted to be uh, part and parcel of that. Got a couple more, and I think these will need to be the last two. I uh, see Kent Ross asked, during your NDE, did you visit with a loved one? No. Nope. Didn't have that opportunity. I would have loved to, but my remember my last thought was I'm drowsy. My next thought was, what am I doing in an ambulance? Tell about birthday. Tell about oh oh yes, um, I had been given a product <clears throat> by the EMTs when they arrived called Versed. It's a very powerful uh, painkiller, but it's also an amnesiac. They give it routinely, apparently, uh, to try and to avoid uh, the patient having PTSD in their minds and telling about the wild stories of going to heaven and seeing their relatives and so forth. It's a shame. <clears throat> I'd like to have tattooed on my chest, do not give me Versed. Um, John, you may see Melody posted a question. We often hear people say, quote, well, she is with the Lord now, but the, uh, but doesn't the Bible say when Jesus come, comes back, all will be judged? Well, now that, <clears throat> you can look at that but, and say that we don't, we don't go to heaven until Jesus returns. But in one respect, that's correct. And that is, remember, I think I told you about the little girl age eight weeks of life she suffocated while nursing because she was her nas nasal passages were clogged with mucus and the mother was forcing her to nurse and the child couldn't breathe mouth was completely wrapped around the, the uh, breast and the nose was blocked with mucus and the child suffocated in her arms they rushed to Breckenridge Hospital, which was not far away there in Austin. Uh, the ER team alerted, met him at the curb, pushed the baby away, and resuscitated the child. Three and a half years later, the mother and child were going past Breckenridge on Interstate 35 there. The child looked up and saw Breckenridge going by and said, oh, look, mommy, that's where Jesus brought me back to you. And the mother nearly wrecked the car because she'd never told the child about her death, about God, about Jesus, nothing. Had not brought her back to church after her baptism. And the child, uh, she got off the expressway and, the, and asked the child excitedly, what did you say? And the child said, well, mommy, you know, Jesus came and got me, but he brought me back to you there. Okay, in that respect, Jesus did come. Jesus did come and she was taken away and brought back to her mother there. In that respect, yes, um, Jesus comes and we're judged, but it's in an instant it, because there's no time on the other side. It's eternity. And um, you could be dead for only just a few minutes. Elizabeth Crone told me she, would, she was dead for 
five, six, seven, eight minutes. And in that period of time, she had 30 minutes. No, 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 three weeks in a garden with the Lord. And I said, the Lord, Adonai or Yeshua? And she said, Adonai. Now, Adonai is the Hebrew word for the Lord, for uh, that is used instead of the holy name of God, which is with Jews is not to be said except by the high priest on Yom Kippur in the holiest of holies. So they, instead of saying the, the sacred name of God, um, a two-syllable expression, uh, they, they say the Lord in Hebrew, Adonai. Um, <clears throat> so the concept that we, uh, we don't go to heaven until Jesus returns, Jesus returned for her. A parishioner of mine was dying of cancer, got down to 65 pounds, clearly on a DNR, do not resuscitate. And she was very quiet. The nurse detected no pulse, no breathing, and told the family she's dead. And the husband and daughter came over and cried for a while. Then he went to telephone my number. And while he was dialing my number on an old rotary dial, which was taking a while, the nurse let out a little yelp. And he turned around and looked, and there's his wife moving her head, looking around the room. Well, she had been sent back because there was more for her to do. She lived one more week, in which time she talked about how uh, she had lived through a terrible time in the life of that church before I got there. And she heard my first three years of sermons all over again in her review of her life, in which time uh, she said, God told me John Price is right. We're, we're not to, we're, we're to pray for our enemies and not work against them. And then she was sent back. She told 15 women about that in the next week. And uh, the women came to me after the funeral and said, we want to talk. I said, so do I. So I said, what did Etta tell you? And they all gave this, they told the same story. Etta had been judged for the terrible things she was involved in, in putting my immediate predecessor and one of his predecessors in the state hospital with nervous breakdown. Uh, the place was vicious. And I didn't know a bit of that or probably would have asked for some a different assignment. But I was there before I found out about it <laughs> and stayed 20 years longer than all my predecessors put together because I came in and preached love. Love God, love neighbor, love self. And it turned the place around. But for Etta, Yes, Jesus came. That's instant at the death of the body and the soul being free. It's not a thousand years from now. So, John, we have one more question that I would like to address briefly that came to me. Can we speak to the sorrow some have after coming back and how to deal with it? Um, say again? I, I couldn't understand that. Um, can you speak to the sorrow that some have after coming back? Oh, yes. Good deal. point. Sure. Heavens, you've been in paradise. It's the most loving, beautiful, musical place. You <laughs> And people argue with God. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back. But Many people are given a choice. One woman told me that she drowned at age eight, and she realized how wonderful it was to be on the other side. But she realized as well, and she was she was told, "You can stay if you want, or you can go back." And she thought of her mother, who would be devastated at her death of her eight-year-old child. And so, blink in the next instance, she's back in her body <clears throat> with water being pumped out of her lungs. So, um, 
yeah, there are a lot of people that are unhappy about being sent back. Many people feel rejected by God. They're missing the point. Mark Twain had a wonderful thing to say. He said, if you ever wondered whether there's something left for you to do, there's a very simple question. Are you alive? In Ecclesiastes 3, there's a magnificent statement. Everything under heaven, there's a time for everything, on, uh, a time to be, and it starts off with a time to be born and a time to die. And that's the, what the bulk of these people, of these 400 have told me. They were told it wasn't their time. Very much in keeping with Ecclesiastes 3, verse 2. Uh, Pete Seeger wrote a beautiful song about that, that he and Joan Baez and the, the, uh, the birds made recordings of that were very popular back in the 60s <clears throat> and is still available on YouTube. Um, turn, turn, turn is the name of the song. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, My great pleasure. Alan, very much appreciate your expertise and um, your presentation. Thank you.